Let them fight. You've read the title and I promise you this is not going to be clickbait. I'm going to present to you today what I believe is the most powerful build we have ever seen in Stellaris up to this point. Nothing here takes use of any exploits. This is entirely intentional gameplay as the mechanics have been designed. The interactions may or may not be intentional, I suppose, but all of the gameplay here is entirely correct. We're going to be getting a fleet power of at least 100,000 by year 30. You can get this up even higher as well. But yeah, that is basically, I'm, I'm pretty sure you can all agree, the most powerful Empire build you've ever heard of or seen in Stellaris. So without any further ado and going on far too long, let's dive in and look at the Scourge are the Empire that we're going to be using today to show off what I think must be the most powerful build we have ever seen in Stellaris. And I do not say that lightly. Is this a bit gimmicky? Yes, absolutely. But you know what? Absolutely nothing will stop the Lich King Arthas from conquering the galaxy. The Scourge here are going to get over 100,000 fleet power, or at least 100,000 fleet power, in the first 30 years. So if you're playing in PvP, that means at the 30-year peace timer, which is generally the norm, you'll have, oh, I don't know, about five times the fleet power of everyone else around you. Now, that is a minimum amount. You can get higher than that. I've heard of people so far who've tried this out, getting as much as 150,000 with the people that I've spoken to. We're gonna show off something that is just a little bit broken. <clears throat> I mean, perfectly balanced as all things should be. So we're going to be a hive mind. This build will require hive to make use of. Now, this isn't because we need the pop growth speed or we need the empire size effect, but because we want to take use of the brand new civic called aseptic drones. This civic is the zombie civic for hive minds. It is like the two other zombie civics we have so far, reanimators and permanent employment, which are for regular biological empires, except this one is for hive minds. What does it do? Well, we start the game with three reanimated amoebas. Additionally, any defeated organic space fauna are automatically animated. So if we find any amoebas or any space whales and kill them, we will automatically animate them. Not only that, if we find Tianki Vet or Amor Alvio, the home system of the amoebas or the space whales, we can claim it, capture it, kill and resurrect all of the space fauna there, and then build a fantastic little station to pump out reanimated fleets every five years or so. We also get the ability to resurrect any defeated organic leviathans. Now, any space fauna that we have in our empire will get plus 50% weapons damage and plus 50% weapon attack speed. That is not just the space fauna themselves, but any space fauna weapons on any craft. So if we, let's say, kill the amoeba and we get our hands on the amoeba strike craft, we'll get a plus 50% weapons damage and plus 50% weapons attack speed to any amoeba strike craft anywhere in our empire. We're going to be pairing this with the Here Be Dragons origin. Now, I can imagine you're already saying, oh no, oh no, no, no. Yes, you see, Here Be Dragons, what does that do? Well, that lets us start with a space dragon roaming around your home system. The dragon may protect you from harm, but beware its wrath should you displease it. Now, you're definitely going to want to displease it. You're going to want to face its wrath and ire, because you're going to kill it and resurrect it. When you do resurrect it, not only will it get bonuses for coming back from the dead, but also because all of its weapons are space fauna weapons, you're going to get some juicy plus 50% weapons damage and plus 50% weapons attack speed. Not only that, as of patch 3.6, the dragon regenerates faster than ever, basically. So we're going to have a monster of a fleet which is composed of a single dragon undead with a jump drive that can basically point and delete anything in the early game. For traits here, I've gone with some generic meta traits. Incubators is going to be better in the short term for us. Phototrophic, because we'll need some extra food lying around when we finally get our dragon online, our zombie dragon that is. And of course, aquatic is as good as ever, even though it's now two points in patch 3.6. When it comes to your secondary civic as well, basically I would recommend you pick pretty much anything you want. I've gone with natural neural network here for extra research alternatives, but you could just as easily go with something like aesthetic to reduce your pop amenities usage. Generally speaking, I haven't found pop amenities too much of a problem at the moment because of the new simulation site building we get. But let's dive in and take a look at this build. And if you're enjoying this video, please infect and reanimate that like button. 
The start is going to be very, very simple. Just play as you would normally play. In this case, I'm going to build a generator district and make sure to start building a colony ship as soon as I can. Scout out all of these additional planets, your guaranteed habitables, find them, colonize them, build up your empire in basically the normal way. You see, the great thing about this build is there's so much variety and the skill ceiling to pull it off isn't really that high. I've actually managed to do it here on a first attempt and I haven't really boiled down into trying to optimize it yet. You are definitely going to need Strikecraft level one. That will be absolutely essential to pulling off this wacky build. If you can get level two as well, that will really help, but don't worry too much about it. In order to help with rolling carrier operations and also rolling another technology we'll need a little bit later, it is very important to make sure you get a Voidcraft expertise researcher to throw into engineering. That's both going to speed everything up and additionally make your chance of rolling certain technologies much, much higher. At around year 10, you might end up with a hungry, hungry hippo. At that point, you can either allow it to land on the planet, probably clearing some space, or give it a warning shot and get it to not land on the planet. Now, if you get it to not land, I haven't run that through, but that might be slightly more optimal in terms of the time it takes us to actually get rid of this dragon. But given the great bonuses you get once the dragon lands, uh, 10 stability and some additional unity for absolutely nothing except 15 food, generally speaking, I think it's better from a holistic point of view to let that baby land. In order to pull off this strategy, you actually don't need that many alloys. Of course, if you go hard into alloys, you'll be able to build additional fleets to complement your dragon, which will be very, very helpful indeed. But I've managed to pull this off. I'm at year 22 here, and I've only got five drones in the entire empire working as metallurgists in alloy foundries. So really, it's not massively important. You could pivot those drones instead and put them into more researchers and therefore get a larger technological lead over your neighbors. After year 20, you'll probably get the chance finally to start rolling Starhold. To maximize this, you'll need to get Expertise Voidcraft in there. And as long as you build at least three starports, you maximize the chance of rolling Starhold technology. Now we absolutely need Starhold technology for the next part of the plan. And that next part comes in the form of defense platforms. You'll want to get some relatively cheap platforms. I'd recommend throwing away the armor because the dragon's weapons are very good against armor and only putting some shields on instead and making sure you have two strike craft in hangar section slots. Now, what we're basically going to do in order to defeat this dragon is build up additional defense platforms. You'll want to have around 11 or 12 platforms. To do that, you'll need to put down a few hangar bays. I'm going to recommend three here and upgrade to a star hold. You see, when you get to a star hold, you get plus nine defense platform cap rather than just this plus six here. And every hangar bay that goes down also increases our defense platform cap as well. The earlier you can get your star hold up, the better it will be for you. Around this time as well at year 20 to 22, you should also stop researching any society technologies and start saving up those research points. We are going to need them in order to reanimate this dragon as fast as alienly possible. When it comes to traditions, of course, I'd always recommend starting off with synchronicity and grabbing instinctive synchronization for hive mind empires. Being able to get rid of all maintenance drones cannot be underestimated. Prosperity is great, the finish is still great, and we've got some lovely effects in it, so complete that. But after that, you will need to grab Unyielding in order to get defensive zeal so we can maximize our star base and defense platform hull points and damage. That will give a fantastic bonus of plus 33%. Later on, you could then start specking into Supremacy, grabbing Overwhelming Force for additional ship fire rate, which is definitely going to help out both your ships and your dragon after you have it. Around year 25 to 26, the dragon will finally take flight from your capital. Basically choose any option you want here, it's simply irrelevant. The main thing we care about is that our dragon here starts roaming around the home system. Do make sure to upgrade your star hold and do everything else I've just talked about. And then once you have a star hold with around 11 to 12 of these defense platforms with hangers, we can get started. This is where the fun begins. You do need to make sure you've got a few hundred alloys saved up as well. You see, the dragon will not sit idly by. They will start killing your defense platforms when you start the battle, and you'll want to be replacing them as fast as possible. It's also a great idea to get a science ship ready in an adjacent system to jump in and begin the special project to reanimate the Titan as soon as it is dead. We will need some ships to begin the fight, so we will proceed to attack this hostile target.
We'll also get ready here as soon as our first platform goes down, we'll begin building more because these will fall rather quickly. If you're enjoying this video and you'd like to get your hands on Stellaris, some Stellaris DLC, or just basically anything from Paradox at the moment, then now is the time I have a great sale for you. Until December the 2nd, you can get up to 75% off on a base Paradox game and up to 50% off on other Paradox DLC by following the link down in the description below. You'll be not only supporting this channel, but supporting charity. Find the links to that and more down in the description below. Now you see why this is going to work is that there have been some changes to combat in Stellaris, specifically the combat rework. As you can see here, Horozgar of the Endless Flame is slowly dying. Whilst we're losing some defense platforms, yes, but overall our starbase is completely fine and we're doing very well, thank you very much. So what is the mechanic at play here that's allowing us to do this? Well, basically when a ship is in combat, they engage from the range of their longest range weapon. In this case for the Sky Dragon, that is its X slot weapon. Uh oh. And its X slot weapon, whilst good, can only kill one defensive platform at a time and has a long cooldown. Its other weapons will then be completely out of range of your star base, which is able to send in wave after wave of fighters to kill and cripple this poor dragon. Yes, you can no longer use armies to bait the dragon, but now the dragon will hopefully, if you get it right, sit way out of range and allow you to kill it slowly. Once it's dead, it's then time to send in the Necro Drones. Don't forget you also get a situation, which is fantastic. You also get the situation for killing the dragon, so you will get additional bonuses when this completes as well, not only your very own dragon. All of this is going to go much, much faster, you see, because we've saved up over 10,000 society research and reanimating the Sky Dragon costs around 10,000 society research. So this is going to be absolutely fantastic. We can get it reanimated in just under two years. And once you reanimate this dragon, you will then get a 100,000 fleet power dragon. Yes, at the moment it says 97.4, but we can increase that with the use of edicts. Just by turning on two edicts, we're already up to 114,000 fleet power. The best part of all of this is not only that, but we have a jump drive now at our disposal, so we can go almost anywhere we need to pretty much instantly. Again, as I've said, this is all before year 30. Now, having a massively powerful, massively mobile fleet, I can't really understate the importance of that in a PvP game. That's gonna be really powerful. And if you play this very, very well, you can also make sure to build your own proper fleet to go alongside your dragon fleet and complement it with some anti-shield weaponry. But what are the applications of this in single player? Well, in single player, it's even more hilariously overpowered. Here are the constructors of McCain, one of my neighbors, and I can propose subjugation and I will get plus 750 to the modifier due to our apparent relative power. Yes, let's proceed with uh, making them into a vassal. We can basically go, yeah, we can basically go around pretty much the whole galaxy now, as long as they are neutral or friendly to us. And one by one, every single AI empire, as long as they're not an overlord, will agree to our subjugation demand because we're just so absolutely overwhelmingly powerful. Yes, I've simply conquered about a third of the galaxy here by doing absolutely nothing at year 30, except saying, hello, I can be your friend, the best friend you've ever had. This, this is just a little bit overpowered, but I must admit these wild builds that we can get on release day are absolutely fantastic. Now it's entirely possible we might see some use of this in the upcoming tournament that I'm organizing, which will take place on December the 10th. If you'd like to participate in that, I'll make sure there's a link to the sign up form down in the description below. If you've enjoyed this video about the patch 3.6 rework and you're desperate to get your hands on more juicy information about Stellaris 3.6, click the video on screen now.